Hey everyone, Sylvie here, Studio Coordinator at Halstead, and I want to welcome you to session two of the Permanent Jewelry Training, which is Knowing Your Supplies, and we are going to talk all about jewelry materials. So the first thing that we're going to start off with are your most common metals that are going to be used in permanent jewelry or considered for permanent jewelry. The first is sterling silver, solid gold, gold filled, and gold plated. And we're going to go into each one of those a little bit more in depth so you can learn a little bit more about them. First of all, sterling silver is one of the most common ones, which I'm sure you're already familiar with and have also seen a lot of other permanent jewelry artists using. Um, sterling silver is an alloy of fine silver and copper, and what that means is it's fine silver mixed up with copper, and it's 92.5% fine silver and 7.5% copper. And you will see it marked with 0.925 or sterling. That's how you know that the material is sterling silver and not just a silver colored metal like nickel or a different alloy, um, silver with a higher co copper content. Sterling silver is very widely available and it's a nice durable material as well. You're going to see it have that kind of bright white color, um, but you also may see silver uh, with a black finish and that means it's been oxidized. So it's been treated to give it a black finish. Solid gold, which is also a great, great option for permanent jewelry. There are tons of different alloys or different combinations of, of solid gold. Um, so you will have rose gold, yellow gold, white gold. Those are going to be your most common. And then you also have the different carat contents. Um, so carat refers to the parts of pure gold per 24. Um, and you'll see that any sort of solid gold labeled with the number and a K, um, or you'll see it labeled with a number that represents the percentage of gold. So you might see it labeled as 14K or 585. So 14 karat gold is 58% pure gold. So that's why you have the 585. The most common material of solid, the most common alloy of solid gold is going to be 14 karat for permanent jewelry. It's a nice um, solid option. It's really durable as you get higher into the pure gold content. So as you move up into 18, 22 or 24 karat gold, the material is getting softer, but it's also getting more yellow. So that's something to consider. 22 or 24 karat gold are definitely going to be too soft for permanent wear. Um, think about it like wedding rings. Wedding rings you're most commonly going to find anywhere from 10 karat to 18 karat, so that's a good range to stay in for permanent jewelry as well. The thing with solid gold, however, is it is at a high price point. Next, we have gold filled which is a layered product. And the way that gold filled is made is a layer of 12 karat or 14 karat. You most commonly see 14 karat. Gold is bonded to a different material through heat and pressure. Um, and that's typically jeweler's brass. The thing with gold filled is it must be 5% total weight in gold. So that thickness of gold has to equal 5% of the total weight of the piece. And you will see that typically labeled 14 over 20 or GF. And you can see in this image um, on the screen that there are a couple different ways that gold filled exists out in the world. You have single clad, which means that all that gold is on one side of the material double clad, which means it's on split between both, so that would be your sheet material, or wire clad, which means it's just fully surrounding that piece of wire. And lastly, we have gold plated. 
It is created through an electroplating process. So that means that small molecules of gold are deposited onto the material that you're plating through an electric current. It is not bonded through heat and pressure like gold filled. It is a very thin layer of gold. So there isn't really a standard to thickness of gold plating that can vary. And you can have almost any material underneath. It can be copper, brass, sterling, um, nickel, some sort of base metal that you don't really know. Um, there are variations in the material that's inside of gold filled, but typically you will see brass and you can always reach out to your supplier to find out exactly what that material is as well. Now a little bit about gold filled versus gold plating. We get this question a lot is, is it okay to use gold plated materials for permanent jewelry? we do not recommend it um and as well as just going into the difference of how they're made and the difference of material because because it can be a little confusing because they are similar so the first main difference is the amount of gold there is significantly more gold in a gold filled product it's 0.5 it is five percent of the total weight whereas gold filled is a lot less. You can see in that infographic on the bottom that you can just see the thickness of the coating is much thicker in gold filled. The second difference is the manufacturing process. Um, gold filled product is created with heat and pressure, like I said, creating a layered product. And gold plated pieces are created by depositing the metal onto the material via an electric current. So you can see that in that image over there with all those little moving gold balls. Um, so those are representing the gold particles that are floating around in that solution. And when you run an electric current through it, those positively charged gold particles are attracted to the negatively charged item. So your chain or your charm, and then they stick to it. And that's how you get a gold plated piece. And like I said, there isn't always a specific thickness that plating is done to that can vary. Whereas gold filled always must be 5% of the total weight. Otherwise you can't legally call it gold filled. And lastly, we have the difference in durability. So gold filled products are significantly more durable because there is more gold and less likely to tarnish because there is more gold. If you have a gold plated piece, you are more likely going to wear through that layer of gold much faster than a gold filled piece. Therefore, exposing the material underneath, underneath which may be uh, likely to tarnish like brass or copper. What metals are best used for permanent jewelry? We always recommend sterling silver or solid gold. They are going to be your most stable and reliable materials. We tend not to recommend gold filled or gold plated because they are not solid products. So because of that, they're, they are um, more susceptible to wear risks. So wearing through that layer of gold, which will cause discoloration. Um, that can also cause tarnishing on the skin. So when your skin reacts to certain metals, it may change color and gold filled or plated products are more likely to cause skin discoloration as well as discoloration of the material themselves because that layer of gold may wear away with constant wear. Whereas solid gold is not going to do that and sterling silver with constant wear is a fairly low reactive metal to tarnish. The main thing that you want to be aware of, however, when using any of these materials, if you do choose to go with gold filled because it's a great alternative to gold because of the price point, it's cheaper. You, make, you want to make sure that you educate your customers on what the risks associated are. Um, so that would be tarnishing um, 
and things like that. And one of the things to remember with gold filled also is that because it is a layer product, when you're welding it, you are going to melt those materials, those layers together. So therefore you're creating a spot that is not entirely covered in solid gold. And that one spot is more likely to tarnish and become noticeable. So if you're welding gold filled jump rings, that weld spot may turn black fairly quickly. Um, to get around that, you can use a solid gold jump ring or just make sure that you educate your customers on the risks and the characteristics of the metals that they have option to purchase for their permanent jewelry. The next thing we're going to talk about is breakaway points. And this is really important as you are wearing permanent jewelry. So something that has no clasp, you cannot take it off. There's no way to remove it besides cutting it. So what is a breakaway point? A breakaway point is where the jewelry would snap or break if it was tugged on hard enough. Um, and why do you want a breakaway point? Uh, to avoid injury, essentially, is the main reason. So jewelry was not meant to be permanent. You would typically take off a bracelet or your rings if you're doing extreme sports or if you're gardening or things like that, um, which is why you want to be conscious of a breakaway point with permanent jewelry as you're not taking it off. So um, you want to make sure that it would break if tugged on or caught on something so that it doesn't essentially dramatically rip your hand off. You definitely do not want that. Um, so the things that are going to factor into your breakaway points are the chain thickness and size. Typically your smaller chains are going to be better for permanent jewelry because they are more likely to break. Um, two to three millimeters in size, overall size for your chain is um, kind of a sweet spot but you also want to be aware of how thick those links are. And many jewelry suppliers will tell you the thickness of that link. Um, you can find that information on every chain that Halstead sells. Um, it'll include that information. And factoring into that is also the weight of the chain. If you're looking and comparing two different chains, look at the weight of them. One of them may be significantly heavier, perhaps indicating that it is made out of a thicker wire or something like that, and therefore less likely to break. In addition to the chain thickness is you want to consider the jump ring thickness um, because that can also be a breakaway point. Um, you don't really want to go any with anything super thick like 16 gauge. That's a pretty hardy jump ring. So you wouldn't want to use that because it's less likely to give way if it was tugged on or something like that. Um, now, if you do choose to use a thicker chain, consider perhaps not welding your jump ring shut. So keeping that open jump ring is going to allow for a breakaway point as well if you want to use a thicker, hardier, sturdier chain. And then the last is we recommend only two bracelets per wrist. The more bracelets you have on, the they become like a thicker chain. So if something catches on all of your bracelets at once, it's acting like a much thicker chain. So it is less likely to break if it hooks on to six bracelets all at once. So two bracelets is still more likely to break and therefore um, avoid any injury, God forbid, the bracelets caught on something. So these are just a few of our chains that we offer. Um, in sterling silver and gold filled, just to also show you a size on a wrist. Um, these are smaller chains that vary in style, so there's a lot of options for style, um, but they're all kind of within that sweet spot of chain thickness and size for permanent jewelry. The next thing is other materials to consider. Charms and connectors and links are really popular and they're a great way to personalize permanent jewelry for your customers and make that welding experience a little bit more personal for them and special. 
Um, a couple things that, a couple materials that you may see. Um, the first one is enamel. Enamel is a layer of glass that is bonded to the material. And it is not recommended for everyday wear because it's glass. So therefore it's likely to chip or break off. Um, if exposed to chemicals, it can dull that shiny glass finish. So it's not recommended that you would wear it every day. Typically enamel jewelry is removed at the end of the day. And then you're also going to incorporate, um, you can, you'll, you will ex ex see other types of stones or pearls. Um, so there are certain stones right off the bat that we do not recommend for permanent jewelry. That would be pearls, opals, and turquoise. Those are going to be your main ones that are also popular stones that your customers might be looking for. And we don't recommend those because they can't withstand everyday wear and tear and are more likely to crack, break, or lose their luster. And that's specific to pearls or opals. It's very easy to lose that shine um, and that really nice finish that draws you into them. Something to consider about um, when deciding whether a stone is appropriate for permanent jewelry or not is the Mohs hardness and that's a scale of how hard the stone is or how easily it will scratch. We're going to touch a little bit more on that later and also the toughness of stones. How likely are they to break if you hit them or knocked them against something? So that's something that you want to factor in and just because you can buy some of these as a link or connector or charm um, to opal charms or enameled connectors or things like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good for permanent jewelry. You can place those charms and things like that on bracelets or necklaces with a clasp if you'd like to incorporate them into your line, but they are not recommended for everyday wear. And all of this factors into that same idea of customer education. Just making sure you communicate to your customer the risks associated with the materials that they are choosing. Um, that's going to be your best bet. Also against them coming back to you later and saying, hey, why did it do this? You have to communicate that information to them. Another thing that comes with picking your materials is tarnish. Most metals can and will tarnish. It is just what they do um, and that's totally okay. It's very normal. Um, tarnish will present itself by having the metal turn black or brown or a kind of sandy color or green. You can often see sterling silver will tarnish by first going through kind of a straw color and then transitioning to a darker color. Um, constant wear and exposure to chemicals like lotions, perfumes, and your personal body pH can cause your permanent jewelry to tarnish. Um, it is that constant wear that exposes it to chemicals, which is going to turn it, um, which is more likely to cause your materials to tarnish. Sterling silver does like to be worn as a tarnish preventative measure because the oils from your skin will help protect it. However, if it is exposed to certain things like a swimming pool or a hot tub, it may likely turn black. Um, and although the risk of gold tarnishing is relatively low, it is still possible. And that does factor in a little bit more into, into um, your body pH and so that would be the human touch. That's your skin and just the way that your skin pH reacts to metals. Um, everyone is different. Uh, sterling silver and solid gold have relatively low reactive rates to skin. Um, however, they can still turn skin black or green. Um, Typically, your skin is going to react to metals with a high copper content in them, 
Um, so that would be copper, brass. Um, it often reacts to nickel. Many people have a nickel allergy. Um, and plated jewelry are also going to cause a, have a higher chance of reacting with your skin. And that's because that's a thin layer of gold and it's exposing what's underneath. Um, like I mentioned, everybody's body is different and will react to the constant wear of metal differently. Um, there's a saying that jewelry is the last thing on and the first thing off. And that is in reference to when you put it on and avoiding some of those chemicals like perfumes or lotions that are more likely to tarnish your jewelry and have an effect and reaction between your skin. Um, as I mentioned, plated products, they're more likely to wear off that layer of gold, exposing what's underneath um, and causing the material to, uh, to turn your skin a different color or have an allergic reaction to that. How to clean your permanent jewelry if it does tarnish. There are a couple ways that you can approach this. Um, baking soda or mild dish soap, warm water, and a soft toothbrush is a great start. Um, jewelry polishing cloths or pads are also another option. You may see um, commercial tarnish removing solutions. Um, you can often buy them at the drugstore and they're really great for jewelry that is not on your body. Do not put that stuff on your skin. It's really not good for you. It is very harsh. Um, and the first way you can tell that it's really harsh is by opening it up and you can smell it. It is an incredibly strong smell. So please don't put that stuff on your body. Use one of the other two methods to clean your permanent jewelry. The tarnish dip solutions are great for pieces that have clasps. Necklaces and bracelets with a clasp are great to dip into that stuff. They will remove the tarnish exceptionally well, but we do not recommend that you put that stuff on your skin. Um, next, when you're thinking about your materials and you're learning about jewelry, there are a couple terms that you might encounter when looking at chains or things like that. Um, the first thing you may experience is the terms hard, half hard, and dead soft. Those are all in reference to the temper of the metal or how stiff it is. Um, this is important to um, jewelers who craft the pieces entirely out of raw materials like wire, um, but you will also find this information um, on jump rings and earring wires. So you'll typically find it on mill product like sheet and wire that you can use to make whatever you want, but you'll also find it on certain findings like I mentioned jump rings and earring wires. Um, and that, like I said, is in reference to how hard it is. Hard is your stiffest and dead soft is your most flexible. Um, and we have a temper chart over there on the left. That's the temper chart that Halstead places on all of their products that have a temper. Um, and we use a number scale to indicate how hard that piece is with zero being fully annealed or dead soft and eight being spring hard. So like super, super tough. Um, so that's something to consider and um, a term that you will likely encounter when looking at jewelry materials. The next term is gauge and that's going to refer to the thickness of metal. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and you'll see that referred to as a number. The tricky thing about gauge is that the higher the number, the thinner the gauge. So that's a little confusing. If you have something that's labeled as 24 gauge, that's going to be much thinner than something labeled as 16 gauge. And all of the gauges have a millimeter conversion to help you better visualize them. And that's very easy to look it up. There's charts that will tell you that information. And the more you encounter and work with jewelry materials, you'll learn that thickness just by the gauge number and what's appropriate for what you're doing. 
The next term is in al is alloy, and that means a mix of pure metals. As we discussed earlier about sterling silver and different carat weights of gold, is those are all alloys. So sterling silver is a combination of fine silver and copper. Fine silver is the pure metal as well as copper. They're both pure metals, and the alloy is sterling silver. And then the next term that you might encounter or want to be cognizant of is the Mohs scale, and that indicates how hard a stone is. So Mohs only refers to the scratchability, in a sense, of a stone. So you can see this chart here from um, the National Park Service via the International Gem Society of what materials are going to scratch those stones. So your diamond is going to be your hardest stone and nothing's going to scratch that. But certain stones like gypsum, your fingernail will scratch that. So Mohs is referring to the hardness and you can see some of the most common um, stones used in jewelry in the chart on the left with their relative hardnesses. So sapphires and rubies are great because they're nice and hard. Um, but you also want to take into account um, how easily a stone will break. So regardless of how hard it is, it might be really easy if it knocks on something to fracture. So despite diamonds being really, really hard, they can break fairly easily if you hit them in just a sweet spot on one of their facets, they will chip or shatter. So that's something to take into account with Mohs hardness when picking what stones may be appropriate to add to permanent jewelry for everyday wear. The next thing I want to talk about is the metals market. This is not really the fun part of picking materials or learning about materials for jewelry making, but it is something that you need to be aware of. So the metals market is um, a commodity market, which is the selling of raw materials. So within that pricing structure, it's going to vary. So the metals market is the price of silver and gold at any given time, and that price changes frequently. There are lots of different things that will affect that price, and that would be things like supply, demand, and the overall economy can affect the prices of metal. Um, so that can be people's feelings towards the economy, um, events that are happening in the world that may cause people to be a little bit nervous about money or things like that. Any of those things can affect the metals market. Um, and you can see in this chart here kind of just how it's varied for silver. It changes all of the time. And what does this mean for you? It means that the cost of your materials will change as well. Trusted suppliers will always base their pricing off of the metals market. So that means that every day the materials, the cost of materials will likely change if you are purchasing them from a trusted supplier. Um, here at Halstead, that is how we price our materials because we purchase them at the metals market price. So that affects um, our pricing as well. And we don't price whether it increase or decrease our prices whether a material or an item is popular or not so if you are seeing um something like that then it is you want to be wary of that supplier and make sure that you do your research um so this means that like i said the cost of your materials will often change they will likely be similar to the day before or the day after a couple months, but um, you never know. So that's just an explanation of why one month to the other, your prices might change. And it's something to be aware of as well. Um, especially if you're working in carat gold, that price can fluctuate. Um, and that's going to affect what you're buying your materials at and what you should be selling them at as well. 
Um, and lastly, why do you want to buy from a trusted retailer? The first thing is quality. Trusted retailers are always going to be lab testing and quality controlling all of their products. So they're lab testing to ensure that they are the material that their vendor says they are. So making sure that silver content is 92.5% or making sure that that gold filled piece is 5% gold total weight. They're always going to be doing quality um, control and lab testing. Um, and um, quality control also factors into how that product is made. If you're buying um, little stud earrings with stones in them as an upsell, uh, your trusted retailer is going to make sure that those stones are set straight and even and nice. Um, so they're going to make sure that you get the best product possible. The next thing is reliability. Uh, Halstead is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. So we've been serving the jewelry industry for a really long time. And that means that we've got years and years of reviews to back ourselves up. Make sure that you do your research on your suppliers. Don't look for just the cheapest price. Also look for and learn about the company that you're purchasing from. The next thing is going to be transparency. Trusted suppliers will provide the information that you need and that you are looking for. So that's going to be information about the nation of origin of where that where that finding or chain is made, its content of recycled material and much more. I mentioned that Halstead includes the thickness of the wire links on all of its chain. So that's going to be something that's going to factor into the, their transparency. And oftentimes the retailers, your trusted retailers will include a page on their website about that, just how much information they provide. And if you have a question and reach out, they're going to give you that information point blank and they're not going to tiptoe around it. And the last thing is trusted retailers and suppliers are knowledgeable. Their customer service knows the products that they're talking about and the materials. Um, here at Halstead, all of our customer service staff has jewelry training. They take in-house jewelry courses here so that they can learn about the materials and the processes that you're using and be better able to answer your questions and have probably experienced some of the issues and heartaches that you have felt when learning jewelry. Um, we also have a jeweler on staff. I went to school for jewelry. That is my background and what I learned. So if you have any additional or more advanced questions, they'll get directed towards me and I'll be able to answer them for you. So just be mindful of that when you're looking for whoever you wanna purchase your supplies from, take those things into consideration and just make sure you do your research. Um, we, have, we are currently offering a couple of permanent jewelry kits. They're great starter kits to get you started and practicing and playing around with jewelry. Um, we have a sterling silver one and one in 14 karat gold. So that's kit seven and kit eight. And you can see the options um, of what's included in each kit. And it's really great because it's got the chain, charms and jump rings for you to make jewelry brace, permanent jewelry. And each kit will also tell you approximately how many pieces it will make. So you can know that it gives you a starter um, and some practice before you then decide what chains you might want to buy and what you think will be best for your customers, what charms you like, things like that.